thanks everyone for coming. It's really lovely to see so many people uh, interested in this subject. Um, we have had a sense that it's something that a lot of people are interested in and this just kind of confirms that uh, this is a story that people in Broome want to hear about. Um, now, Anna and I are going to be telling you today about this research project, uh, which we've been working on since the middle of last year, uh, the Anne Street Reserve Social History Project. The project has been conducted in partnership with Nyambaburi Yaru and has been funded partly by the Shire of Broome and also from a research grant from the University of Notre Dame. People lived on the Anne Street Reserve between 1968 and 1982 in an area just to the west of where the small town of Broome was then situated. Back in those days, Broome was a very different town to what it is now. The population was only around 2,000 people. Um, aerial <coughs> photograph on the slide is from 1971 and shows that the Anne Street Reserve was then somewhat removed from the main part of town, although it was connected via bush tracks. The road it connects to is onto Anne Street. I'm not sure if this is the words. So this is Anne Street here, and this is Dora Street, and that's where Brahms is now. That's the hospital near the bottom. Yeah, that's what was then the back hospital, the old Navy hospital. Anyway. Um, uh, just a little bit of background. Much earlier in the 20th century, because of the pearling industry, Broome was exempt from the White Australia policy, which was introduced nationally in uh, 1901. So in the first half of the 20th century, the majority of people living in Broome were from China, Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia and surrounding countries. This image here is from Sun Cinemas early last century, and probably many of you can't really see the photograph, but people of Asian descent are at the front, pearling masters are sitting in the middle uh, in their white jackets and the Aboriginal people are sort of up the back in the schools and how like. Must have been a big movie because there's a lot of people there. Um, by the late 1960s, the demographics of Broome remained unlike anywhere else in Australia, with half the population being of Aboriginal and mixed Asian Aboriginal descent. Um, where the project idea came from. For me, this project is a little unusual because in part, this project is also about my history, my family, my mother and my father, and my four brothers and eight sisters. Two brothers and two of my sisters have passed away a long time ago. I can remember we lived in Down Street or Serve in a small two room tin shack. Lots of, lots of people from my age have memories of the reserve, even for people who didn't live there but used to come and visit at the reserve. I've been involved in all kinds of research projects over my eight plus years at the University of Notre Dame in, in Rome. But this is the first project that really incorporates my own history and my family's history after leaving Gidiranga. So that makes it special to me. The project idea really started with a conversation with Catherine about my childhood. She was just asking me where I grew up, what my life was like as a child in the 1970s in Rome. And every time we sit around a campfire or sitting out bush with my family, I talk a lot about the Anne Street Reserve, the native reserve as it was called back then. Catherine became interested in this reserve project because unlike other reserves areas around Rome, the Anne Street Reserve no longer exists. The area where it used to be is now covered in high density state housing that was built there in the 80s after people were moved off, to the, off the reserve. So, we both started looking around in local libraries and at the museum to see what we could find about those days and about the reserve and the families that lived there. And we really couldn't find anything at all. Anne Street Reserve was a part of room history that was not recorded. I felt her story needed to come to the surface and be told. So we started to talk to people associated with the reserve to see if there was support and interest in the community in this project happening. And people were very supportive. I'll just talk a little bit about <coughs> kind of methodology of the project. Uh, once Anna and I had secured a little bit of uh, funding, 
we began to interview people. Um, we decided to start with the older people first. The generation who were adults on the reserve, generally raising their children, are now quite advanced in age. So we thought there was a strong <coughs> impetus to try and capture their stories as a priority. We have spoken to many older people in the room, although these conversations have often also included extended family members uh, and children who are growing up on the Anne Street Reserve. Anna has also travelled to Bijanaga and to Beagle Bay uh, to speak to senior people in those places who moved back in recent decades. There's photos up there about um, some pictures of the Anstrick Museum. That handsome man up there is my young brother, one of my brothers, and that's Frankie Shabba. Um, <coughs> in addition to interviewing ex-residents of the reserve, we have been searching the archives and materials relating to the Anstrick Reserve and also to Rome for more, gen uh, more generally in the 1970s. We were lucky to make contact with Fran Crawford, who was the welfare officer in the 1970s and worked with a lot of families in the reserve. She gave us photographs, the only ones we have of the actual reserve, and also lots of documents, including minutes from meetings held on the reserve and so forth. <coughs> we also engaged Perth-based historian Steve Hawke to search the state record office for us and we worked with staff at the Department of Aboriginal Affairs to find relevant materials. Given there were already a, a number of other reserves established around Broome, such as One Mile and Kennedy Hill, uh, in the late 60s that is, an obvious question that occurred to me was, um, why establish another reserve? The area where the Anne Street Reserve was established had previously been a place where people had camped, so we were told. So this is actually a map um, that I just photocopied. I found in a um, magazine from 10 years ago, the West Weekend Australian magazine, which had a story about the Common Gate in Broome, which I expect was connected to the development of the exhibition that's now held permanently at Yaru. Um, so this is a, a map of Broome from the 1950s or even earlier. And the yellow dotted line is where the Common Gate went. Uh, it was, in fact, kind of a cattle fence, really. Um, and up here, you probably can't see it, says the third common gate. Uh, this is uh, this is Anne Street, so that's where Anne Street stopped. That's the native hospital. And this is where the Anne Street Reserve was established um, some years later. Mm -hmm. And some people that we spoke to could remember camping near there a um, long time ago, these are some of the oldest people that um, we spoke to. So I think people were already camping there, and in fact, people were camping in a lot of places along the coast. It's very well documented in lots of the um, native welfare reports from the 50s and 60s. Um, okay, so, uh, Yes, the, fence, the common gate, the fence was originally erected to keep cattle out of Broome, but with the passing of the WA Aborigines Act in 1905 became the boundary to regulate entry of Aboriginal people. It was to remain in place until the repeal of the Native Citizenships, Citizenship Rights Act in 1971 and the Native Welfare Acts in 1972. So I'm just trying to provide a little bit of sort of historical context here to the uh, establishment of the reserve. Um, in addition to the cultural orientations of these reserves, the establishment of such places needs to be read in an historic context uh, and the context of the appalling instruments of control, categorisation and exclusion of people that were applied under various laws in Western Australia, beginning with the, West, with the Aborigines Act of 1905, which morphed over the next half century into the Native Welfare Act. Under these laws, a person who, and I quote, had adopted a civilised life, could apply for citizenship rights. Such an individual had to demonstrate that she or he had dissolved native and tribal associations, could speak English and was industrious. Once granted, these new rights meant the person could own property, send their children to state schools, attend mainstream hospitals and drink at licensed premises. They, rather than the Commissioner of Native Affairs, would become the legal guardians of their own children. They would have been prohibited, like other non-Aboriginal people, from visiting reserves. 
Once granted, a person's citizenship certificate could be cancelled on the basis of a complaint from anybody. The majority of Aboriginal people, however, did not have status as non-natives. And those that did, for those that did, their status was fragile indeed. As I just mentioned, this Native Title, sorry, this Native Welfare Act was not repealed until 1971. The Anne Street Reserve story then, because of the timing of its establishment and then its closure, captures the transition for people from living under this extremely oppressive policy and administrative regime to a far more progressive one. Um, of course, the Anne Street Reserve was not the only reserve set up in or near Taboo, and uh, many people in this room would be very aware of that. Um, there are a number of reserves established for various purposes, including the Native Hospital Reserve, which was established in the late 1930s. The photograph uh, here on the right, taken in around 1973, shows the kind of accommodation that many, many people uh, had uh, in the early 70s and late 60s who were camping around Broome. Um, the photo on the left is of the kind of houses built on the Anne Street Reserve although this photograph is actually from one mile. No, from, up, from up the hill. I was going to say that it looks like up the hill, look at that hill. Um, a number of families who camped, sorry, a number of families who moved onto the Anne Street Reserve had previously lived at Kennedy Hill or had been camping at the back of the networks. Some families had been previously living uh, at missions in Beagle Bay to the north or at the range to the south. It is generally understood that these reserves were originally established as places where Aboriginal visitors, on places where Aboriginal visitors had come to camp in Broome. All of these reserves have different histories and are associated with different cultural and language groups. Some were associated with stockyards, so stockmen could bring cattle in from stations inland and have somewhere to camp. Others were associated with language groups to the north and south of Yaru, groups with strong, strong cultural and ceremonial ties to the Yaru and Jubun people around the group. We know from various correspondence from the fire to the Department of Native Welfare that in the early 1950s, the number of people camping around the was considered a problem by government people. Most of these areas had no services whatsoever, full sanitation and no running water. The Anne Street Reserve area was officially gazetted in 1952, but it seemed that the Department of Aboriginal Affairs lost track of the reserve for some years. There is various correspondence in the files between um, then between the, the regional head of the, sorry Department of Native Welfare, who was Mr. J. Buharrell, and the Broome Board calling for the establishment of a reserve, but within four years of its establishment in 1953, the Department of Native Welfare can no longer identify where it had been established. It became a kind of ghost reserve. It resurfaced in documentation by the mid-1960s around concerns for the numbers of people camping at Kennedy Hill and on the foreshores, and by 1967 it was being developed. At this stage, in 1967, there were already four houses at One Mile and 11 at Kennedy Hill, and the first six houses constructed at Anne Street Reserve. There were dozens of other shelters on both, on both Kennedy Hill and One Mile that people had constructed by themselves, more like camps. One native welfare reported, report from that year, 1967, estimated that the average population in Wynn was 500 people. By 1972, the average population of Broome was estimated at 709 people, while a handful of houses were being built. The native welfare report reports regularly notes that their informal dwellings on the reserve were being demolished in the name of sanitation. This is a close-up picture of the Anne Street Reserve where I grew up and, more, and other people were up there too. You can see that there is six houses on one side, six on the other side. Evolution blocks at the back and shortcuts all around. We know from the Department of Community Welfare Surveys in the mid-70s and from other interviews, from our interviews, 
that each of these little houses has between 10 and 15 people living in them. Kids, old people, and parents' generation, all there together. I know in my house there were 14 people, plus sometimes other extended family visiting. You can see in the photo of all, all the little bush tracks, shortcuts through the scrubs. These tracks went to Nung College, Formal School, St. Mary's School, and Chinatown. There's lots of other bush tracks too, heading towards the spray pond, which was the town dump and where all us kids used to swim. Everyone used to walk everywhere through the bush and they didn't get lost. A lot of the people I interviewed grew up in the reserve and they had a similar memories of their own of how they lived in the reserve in the 1970s. The stories we have been gathering, of course, have not just been about the Anstrup Reserve. We have been interested to find out where people lived before they moved to the reserve, how they experienced that move and what life was like in general, where they worked, where their children went to school, how they got around as well. So many people we spoke to told us stories about walking to the Sun Pictures, to the number two store, to Tangway for long soup and phone store. And in Chinatown, stores such as Unaway and Wings. These shops sold just about everything in their shops. Some people talked about a few people who did have cars and how these cars were used to take everyone fishing or hunting, especially on weekends and on school holidays at times. There was a number of common themes across the interviews which I'll speak about briefly. For example, a lot of people remember that there was hardly any chronic diseases People walked everywhere. There was no junk food, and there was always a lot of old people around, around the place. The presence of old people might also account for another common memory, which was that there was not much fighting going on in the community. People respected each other, and the authority of the old people was strong. Also, there was a lot, also might, not much drinking going on, and when there was, there were there were strict rules around alcohol where to drink, who to drink with, and so forth. It was <coughs> excluded from family life, and people did not drink around children. People would go drink out in the scrubs. People we interviewed also commented that there were hardly any funerals, not like today, happening in Rome. The stories. I'm just going to ask Catherine to play this small section of an interview that we conducted with Miss Esther Albert. Esther was a young woman in the 1970s. She now lives with her daughter and grandmother in Rural Town. All the people are still living there no? at all and We are always like a family, looking after each other. When, when my brother used to be going nothing, you know. We just share everything that we have. Share it for everybody to come. Free, no charges. Really carry for each other, everyone. And after it was good old days for people, no argument, nothing. No interest, nothing. Everybody was very happy. And guess what we had? But we had someone special coming. A one woman. Yeah, that's true. Eh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every pension week, every pension day, every pension day. The A one woman used to come around and there, everybody, and all of us. This one, From everywhere, you know, the little kids with their mothers. So I'm just going to talk a little bit, a bit about something that I've called the informal economy, which is kind of ways that people made money just by, you know, using their own wits and thinking of what they could sell. And a lot of people talked about those kind of activities. Um, 
Many people have memories of what we might term the informal economy. Generally, people riding bicycles around town, selling all kinds of food or finding other ways to make a little bit of money. I'm just going to read out a couple of quotes now from interviews. Uh, just a warning that uh, some of the stories that people to told us involve um, people who've passed away. So I just want to let you know. Um, so this is from uh, uh, Brenda Shaw, who's now quite an old lady. I remember, oh, I was staying in One Mile for a little while too. They used to put nets out there, the two old people, that were staying in the old block in One Mile. I remember paying 40 cents or 20 cents to give us all that fish. But they used to come around with eggs. Them cracked eggs that I used to remember, they used to have an egg farm out there. And they used to come around, one dollar for a big crate of eggs. They used to come with a ute. Half was cracked, but we still used to buy it off them. Hey girl, they closed it down that farm place. I got sorry for that place, it was popular. And this is from Wilma Rex. Well, when we was living in the reserve, I mean, for me, you know, it was a happy time until we made a decision to move back to Beagle Bay, then back again, but I, but I think at that time, that year, 1977, I think back then, people started to move to reserve, they started to move into Homes West houses. Then I remember, even though people used to go fishing on the weekend or whatever, used to be this old bloke used to come selling fish on the bike in his basket or bag and he used to come and sell fish down the reserve. I remember those days. He used to set his trap down at behind the meatworks or town beach and oh we used to get happy for fresh fish in the mornings especially. And this is from uh, Anna and I had a long conversation with Mari Cox and Ginger Cox um, and here they're talking about the gambling saloon. Uh, which a lot of people talked about. This one was a good place where people went and played cards. Um, so this is Mari now. Yes, that was me and Louisa Gray. And I remember old man Simon used to bring fish and saute and rice. And Linda Dolby used to come. And Auntie Susie Dolby. And they used to sell mangoes. People used to come around selling mangoes. And then Ginger interrupts and says, and from the fidget angle mob, they used to come around to the room and sell tomatoes to us. The fidget angle mob had their own gardens. I can also remember they used to have a dairy farm here too. We used to get our own milk from here. An old Crooksy had a farm here in Broome. And then one more story from Vanessa Polina, who's not here, but I'm sure she wouldn't mind us sharing this little story about her childhood. She was a little kid in the 70s, like Anna. She told us, and she didn't grow up on the reserve, she, she, they had a house in town, but she told us how her father would pack up a couple of little foam eskies with freshly cooked satays and peanut sauce in them. And she would ride around Broome on her bicycle on Saturday morning with eskies on the handlebars selling the satays. And people on the reserve remember Vanessa as a kid coming, bringing this, these satays. So in retrospect, um, we can kind of see that this informal economy was also a kind of freedom. Um, freedom from regulation that you could char characterise that decade more generally as being free from regulation. but. Um, people were free to, to try and make money in really inventive ways. This photo is, a, is, is of a famous old man who passed away a long time ago. I won't say his name because people in this town know him very well and know him. I can remember my mother and father. They both used to take me to behind the back, of, back hospital to watch him dance. Ninety trees and royal families always danced to cobbery, as well as with the other language groups with the Mangala, Gradari, um, Yaru people, and the Yulun people, and so forth. A lot of people who were kids back then remember watching this old man dance. He was a man who taught lots of young people how to dance. This is used to be like an outing for my family. On weekend, it was a special occasion for us, watching this old man dance, and we all had fun. Even though the family of the reserve often had very different histories, they might have been, they might have been Muriel people that come from Beagle Bay, or they might be Yaru, Gardari, Yomara, and Mangara people. They may have moved to Rome for work or to see what the school was like for their children. These differences between family groups, however, were never emphasized by people remembering what life was, was like was like on the reserve. Rather, the emphasis was on connection and how everyone was like a family. It's fairly clear that the cultural obligations to look after one another were still extremely strong. 
People also remember going hunting a lot, collecting bush, <coughs> bush food. People didn't have much money, and yet there was a sense of abundance. Lots of bush tuck always been shared. Many families did not have any refrigerations. Electricity supply was unre unreliable. So there was no way for people to keep their fresh food for long. Language and traditional dancing and singing was a constant part of life for people living on the reserves. Other <coughs> kind of music were also around on the reserve. It was the 1970s after all. I'll read out one quote here from Murray Cox. There was not any TV. TV was just coming out, black and white. TV was coming out, just came out in 1976 or 1977. Virginia's grandfather used to spread a big tarp out in the front of his house and all the kids, his brothers and sisters, used to come there and sit down and tell stories. Put the radio on. The radio Australia would be on and play music. It was just amazing. We had all the time in the world. I mean, it's the culture that they embraced in regards to their own tradition. Anybody in that family can pick up a guitar and play. People we spoke to also remembered that there was plenty of work uh, around Broome in those days. Everybody worked. The Aboriginal population of the town, including that of the reserves, represented a crucial and significant percentage of the workforce. This needs to be put in context of laws that had existed since the turn of the 20th century, which determined that Aboriginal people belonged to their employers and that a person who could not dis demonstrate employment could be arrested. While welfare, or social security did, did become available in the mid-1970s. It took some time for people to be signed up to it. Many, many people still worked at the meat works. Some spent time on stations and moved between the reserve and their work. Uh, some people were domestics, working in the houses of non-Indigenous people in town. In terms of employment, it is noteworthy that everyone we spoke to had work, or their parents did. Men in particular were seemingly in full employment. Um, and this is always noted in the patrol officer reports that the meat works and the pearling industry, especially at Signet Bay, on the wharf, it was a very busy wharf back in the 1970s, uh, or with the Shire, uh, which back then was known as the Rhodes Board, uh, or as general contractors. Okay. The photograph shown here is the dirt road filled with water from Port Hedland to Brown in the mid-1970s. In some ways, this road had kept the town isolated from southern Western Australia. In 1979, the road from Port Hedland to Broome was sealed. Clearly, the interest in Broome as a tourist destination has been increasing over that decade. And as a result, demand for new areas of land was increasing, and land values in the town were skyrocketing. Opening up new areas of development of the town was seen as a priority, both of Broome Shire and from records of Hansard in the early 1980s of the West Australian government. This was also a relevant historical context for the cancellation of the Anne Street Reserve that occurred in 1982. The closure of the reserve was quite controversial at the time for a number of reasons. Apart from some con correspondence with Monica Strack, president of Rome Aboriginal Housing Society, it is clear from all of the government doc documentation that decisions were made without any consultation with local people in Rome. Many of the older people we spoke to expressed sadness of being forced to leave the reserve, despite being provided with much bigger and more modern houses when they did leave. This newspaper cutting is from January 1981. Uh, it notes that there were 90 people, half of them children, living in the camp behind the meatworks and another 20 families uh, at the caravan park. A commissioned report by Ron Richards in 1981, in that same year, made the observation that the subdivision of the Anne Street Reserve would not meet the housing needs of the Broome Aboriginal population. He noted that for the 3,000 inhabitants of Broome in 1981, and six, so 3,000 inhabitants of Broome divided into 620 dwellings, 478 of these dwellings were inhabited by Europeans, on average three people per, ha per house. Um, the rest of the population, however, had to reside in only 150 dwellings, between seven and nine people per house. Richards also recommended 
that all the reserves in and around Broome should be vested in the Aboriginal Lands Trust to preserve the use of the reserves generally for the necessary and continuing use of Aboriginal people after alternative accommodation becomes available. Richards noted that reserves and camps provide more than shelter. They are important places in the lives of not only the permanent residents, but also friends and family who regularly visit Broome. These recommendations were largely ignored by the Aboriginal Lands Trust, who went ahead and sold the reserve land to the State Housing Commission for $50,000, uh, which wasn't very much money even back then, um, to enable the construction of general housing under a policy known at the time as salt and pepper. This despite the acknowledgement in very re various reports at the time of the need for at least 200 houses for <coughs> Aboriginal people alone, the practical outcome of attempting to scatter Aboriginal households amongst white occupied households meant that the rate at which Aboriginal families could be placed in government housing was extremely slow and did not reflect demand. There was a clear sentiment from the community and from a few individuals in the government that if Anne Street was to be developed for the wider community, then there should be recompense through the provision for additional housing in other areas. That the substantial <coughs> Aboriginal reserve estate in Durham was being used to address a housing shortage for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people remains controversial in the memories of many ex-residents <coughs> of the Anne Street Reserve. Some believe that the Aboriginal Lands Trust transfer program at this time dismantled a potential and irreplaceable capital base for Aboriginal people in Broome. This slide is just a, to document, sorry, to demonstrate the massive increase in the size of the town of Broome since the time when the Anne Street Reserve existed. The red line outlines the town size as it was in the early 1970s with the red circles, with the red circles, the Anne Street um, out, in, out in the bush in those days. You can see the vast areas of suburban development which have occurred since then. Unlike other reserves in Rome, there are no trace left except for trees and people's stories and memories. Today, some people we spoke to are concerned that the younger generation don't know about the Anne Street Reserve story. One thing that, that struck both of us uh, as we've kind of been reflecting on what people have been telling us over the life of this project is just how positive uh, people's memories were of life on the Anna Street Reserve, despite considerable material poverty. Um, and this is particularly striking if you look at accounts from um, other reserves in the 1970s. For example, uh, Steve Hawke's study of Fitzroy Crossing. Um, uh, these kind of stories are generally accounts of misery and hardship and, of course, resilience, but they were very hard places to live, um, Aboriginal reserves in the 1970s in general. So what was different about this Anne Street Reserve experience? And uh, anyway, in the course of the work that I was doing, I, I had to had the opportunity to read uh, a recent um, report which was released by Mandy Yap and Eunice Yu, uh, which was a report where they um, put together a series of indicators of well-being developed with Yaru people. So it was a list of ways of measuring well-being according to Yaru people's own sense of <coughs> what matters, I suppose. And uh, what struck me was that all of these measures of well-being were pretty much present for people living on the reserve. Of particular note are uh, figures uh, 13, 14, 15 and 17, you probably can't really read them, uh, which are connected, which, sorry, which are around feeling respected, having a sense of control, feelings of belonging, connectedness, identity, and purpose. Um, while there were welfare officers around in the 1970s, their presence on the Anne Street Reserve, anyway, was fairly minimal. It seems that, in some ways, the Anne Street Reserve was a bit neglected by the welfare officers, which uh, I think the people living on the reserve would probably agree was a fairly good thing. Um, so, the minimal presence of welfare officers might have reflected the degree to which the people living on the reserve were being administered had completely diminished by this time. Um, this was a radical shift to previous decades. The sense of liberation is palpable in many accounts from people we spoke to. People were free to move, free to marry who they wished, 
free to speak language and practice culture, free to drink, free of the fear of having children removed, free to work and free to apply for welfare, free to form organisations, hold meetings, get organised and finally to hold the non-Indigenous people around them to account and to ask questions. This time, of course, was the precursor to what has become known as the self-determination era, which saw a, prolifer a prol proliferation of organisations across the Kimberley set up by Aboriginal people, such as the Kimberley Land Council, um, Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre, Marawarra, and other resource agencies like it, and also the beginnings of the art station movement. It was a time when people started to gain a sense of being in control of their own lives and of their own families, something that had been denied to their predecessors for decades. Ironically, the Broome Native Welfare Report from 1970 notes that the greatest problem with the reserves is, of course, supervision. This is required continually, and without it, conditions soon drastically deteriorate. It was precisely this characteristic, however, a lack of supervision, that contributed to the sense of autonomy and well-being expressed by many people Anna and I spoke to. As Anna Albert reflected on life on the Anne Street Reserve, you didn't have to ask those days. So, I'm just going to move on now to kind of the end of the presentation. Um, uh, we've got a, in terms of project outputs, we have uh, pulled together a reference group of six people uh, who are helping us, uh, guiding us to uh, project outcomes and we'll be continuing to draw on these people's advice as we move into the next phase of the project. People we have spoken to have expressed a strong desire for these stories to be told in Rome and for the positivity and optimism of these times to be communicated. We are in the process of putting together a funding application for Community Arts project to help tell the story of life on the reserve. The Western Australian Museum is also interested in funding some of these creative work. In the longer term, we will also be putting together a book of photos and stories. And maybe also some kind of post podcast or, or audio recording with families and keep and keep and they can you know listen to the audio recording and have a laugh and remember these good times. This is the second last slide. We're getting there. So this is the um, this is a picture of um, a girl who's now in the, over the fifties. Um, this is a picture of Denise Pungana as a child at the Anne Street Reserve. She is one of the ladies um, in, our, in our project committee. This project has been an inspiration for all of us. People are really keen to be involved, to participate, to contribute something towards the project. Because they felt it was time to share and tell, tell the story of the Native Reserve, people want to write songs, they want to keep sharing and talking about it. They also want their stories and memories recorded. So for me, I'm going to end this presentation with a little bit of creativity of mine. Um, I have written a poem and I'm going to end with it. And it's called Memories of the Scrubs. Shortcuts and red dirt, bushfield trees, lots of birds and animals to eat. Walking to school was a distance through wet, hot and dry seasons. Spinifex grass was so thick and scary, cricket and cicadas making noise, gonadal lizards, tartar lizards and goners running across our path, we made it to school. Memories of the scrubs. The kids playing and running all day, our childhood games playing marbles, cubby house, pigeonhole, knuckle jack, red rover and hopscotch. Family sitting around the camps, chatting around the campfires. The pot is boiled, countrymen drinking, drinking a hot pot of tea, hot smoky tea. The memories of the scrubs. The old traditional men talking in language. You can hear the sounds of songs of long time ago. The Yaru, Gardari, Nyonyo, Nyongamara, Mara, and Bar, and Bar people. Old women are talking and laughing, cooking fish, duang or turtle, the aroma of cooking, sharing and caring for each other. 
the memories of the scrubs. Let's go swimming, gang. Let's go to the scrape hole, the first local duck, where the rain falls to fill in the hole with water, murky and red, sharp objects underneath. Who cares? We were kids and we had fun. Heading home and parents are waiting, and waiting with a big stick. <laughs> Our little eyes low to the ground, crying for big rolling from our mothers. Oops, we're in trouble again because we left the camp with white clothing and came back home with red clothing. <laughs> <laughs> the memories of the scrubs. Weekend comes, the social gathering has started. Everybody gather together around to play cards with money we call the kunz or the kunkan. Sometimes the kadikaya sticks and more food, satay and rice or fish and rice, two dollars a plate. The sun is setting. Gotta go back home now on foot through shortcuts back to our tin shacks with families. These are the memories of the scrubs, of me being a kid growing up in the reserve. And I want to acknowledge other people who have memories of the scrub within this project. of that interview. Uh, so if anyone wants to listen to it, that's the um, website address. 